and welcome to the Orient Outlook podcast, sponsored by Carol Andy Flores, with myself, Stephen Nussbaum. And as always, I'm joined by my good friend, my South Stand chum, the bearded legend, the one and only, the daddy It's Mr. Paul Levy. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is episode number 371. And as always, thanks to everyone who tuned in to our last show, which was a couple of weeks ago. We had a rest last week uh, due to the international break. This week, uh, we've obviously got those two weeks' worth of news to catch you up on, in case you've missed anything. We've got two games, uh, we're obviously uh, the uh, MK Dons game uh, and obviously yesterday's game at Stevenage and we've also got our manager Richie Wellens waiting on the line to speak to us so let's not hang around, let's just crack on and as always we start with a word from our podcast sponsor. We certainly do, the podcast is sponsored by Carol Langley Forest, they're based in Chingford and have served the borough of Waltham Forest for over the last 70 years, they've got a fantastic team there, can do anything, weddings, funerals, birthdays, anniversaries, Christmas bouquets and Christmas trees which are coming up this week for you and they offer all O's fans and staff 15% off which is a great deal so to get in touch you can call John and his wonderful team give them a bell on 0208 529 4130 or you go and find them uh, at their website www.carolangley.co.uk or find the team on social media they're on Instagram at Carol Langley Flores they're on Twitter at Carol Langley E4 or you can find the guys on Facebook Carol Langley Flores. Indeed you can. Do get your orders in for the Christmas trees because they always sell mm. fast with uh, with John because of the quality of those trees. So Richie, welcome back onto the Orient Outlook podcast. Thanks very much for giving up some of your Sunday evening to, to speak to us. And we'll start uh, with most uh, relevant was yesterday. Uh, your thoughts on yesterday's game? Uh, it's a good point. Good clean sheet. Obviously not, not a great spectacle, but... Um... You know, you you have to look at the conditions, the opposition that we're playing. We went there when we when we won the league two season and got a doubt that got the ball down and played some good football. Got caught in the ball, gives cheap free kicks away, conceded. Tried to play out from the back. El Mazzuni got caught in the ball, got sent off. Um, and the last twice we've been there, we decided not to play out from the back, and we've not conceded a goal in 100, 180 minutes. Okay, we would like to have more quality and. And people who have probably never played the game will say, why can't we get the ball down and play? But they've never played a professional game in them conditions. I have. So, you know, I felt that out of possession, the players are very, very good. We would like more, you know, when the game, we would like to sell it down, especially in the opposition's final third. But listen, every time they play forward, second half, the ball went out of play. Every time we played forward, first half, the ball went out of play. So really difficult conditions. Um... And the one thing in them conditions you don't want to do is you don't want to, you don't want to go one 0 behind because it's really really difficult to to chase. It was a couple of surprise results yesterday because teams went behind and then when you try to chase again in them conditions it's really really difficult. So um, yeah, please with a point. We don't have to go. And again, if you're playing them conditions in one of the big stadiums, if you stay if you're playing in one of you know a Bolton or a big stadium, the conditions don't really take that much effect. You still get. A, you still get a bit of a gale, but when you're in one of the smallest, if not the smallest, stands in our league, then I don't know if you've ever been to Stevenage, but mm. it's on the side of a couple of A roads mm. and it's open. It's really, really difficult. So, proud of the players' effort and commitment. And like I say, it's part of a season. And when you play a 46 game season, you, you're going to have different types of game. We played brilliant this year against a couple of teams and got nothing. So, today, the other day, was part of the ongoing process. They were trying to get three clean sheets in four. We've only conceded three goals in the last four games, and it was all to Wickham, who Wickham are scoring three and four past everybody at the moment. So, starting to keep clean sheets, starting to look more solid and, and building the foundations after obviously the first four games. You've obviously mentioned clean sheets, which I think that's coincided with Josh Keeley coming into the lineup and kind of establishing himself as a number one. What What are your thoughts on Josh, uh, Richie? Uh, he's not. He's not just Josh. Every time. We, We've had two really bad spells this year. We've lost the first four games because of the situation in pre-season where I think come the Bolton game, I haven't played that, that team at all in pre-season. And then we recover. We then play the two games, Stockport and Reading, where we win. We draw against Peter and, and Wrexham. I think we're in a bit of momentum. Then what happens? We lose Galbraith for a game. We lose Sean Clare out injured. And you're having to start with coming up with something else. So... He, that's just coincided. We started to get a little bit of a settled back four, um, and I think that has helped the goalkeeper. Josh has come in and, and done great. Um, again, part of his development on Saturday. It's not all about playing out from the back. It's something that we want to do. We, we've done it really well in the past. But hitting areas, he could have hit areas better from his, his distribution, allowed us to land on, on second balls better on Saturday. But um, 
yeah, we're really pleased with him. A young goalkeeper with a lot of quality, but more than anything, he's got a really good character for the game and he settled in really well. Where does that leave Zach Hemming now? Because obviously we started with him first choice. Obviously, he wasn't the best of debuts or starts for Zach. Where, where does that leave him now? Is He's obviously back up to, to Josh? Well, he's, he, he's part of professional sport. You, you, you support your teammate, you train as hard as you can, you wait for your, <clears throat> for your, for your next opportunity and... And Zach, I have to say, has been excellent in the last four or five weeks with the way that he's trained by the side of Romacy and, and and Josh and Noah Phillips. And, and his character and charisma has come out in the last four or five weeks. He's, really, he's been a brilliant lad to be around and he's been a big part of the last four or five games. In terms of the season so far, then, Richie, you obviously mentioned it's a 46-game season. I think we're 15 games in, so almost a third of the way through the season so far. What, what are your thoughts on the season? I mean, knowing you and kind of kind of how... Um, ambitious you are sitting here at 21st in the table you, you can't be happy with I guess the league position but in terms of performances I guess you probably are so give us your thoughts on the season Richie Yeah I think there's a, there's a couple of things the first four games put us on the back foot straight away we, without a doubt and then there's a couple of games in there the Shrewsbury game is one the Northampton game is another the Exeter game is another where we need to win one we need to win two of them all of a sudden, won 21 points. We've got maybe a game in hand or two games in hand in a couple. And we're mid-table. That has a massive slant on on the league table. But what I'm trying to do is, if we if we look at the last... Um, if we take away them first four games, we look at the last 11 games, we're mid-table. If you look at the last four games, we're actually joint fifth in the league in the form table. So, like I say, it's a, it's a long season. Mm. It's, every team in this league are going to go through... Who dips? We've had we've had one or two of them, um, and hopefully we're on up with Curd now. And I would like to have a, a spell where we have our strongest team out. But like I say, you, you look at a lot of teams having a lot of injuries at the moment and so on. So hopefully now we can settle down. There's no international breaks um, for a good four months. That's been a problem because when you when you're not playing for two weeks, look. I, I look at the um, the game on Saturday. We. We, we was OK in, in the game, in, in a lot of defensive aspects, but going forward, we was we was off it. We only trained on Friday with Ethan Galbraith. You don't see him for 10 days. Mm. So it can be tough, them international breaks. You mentioned putting out the strongest team. I must ask you, I don't think you've had a chance to put out, I guess, many fans' is perception of your strongest eleven due to injuries since kind of last October when Jordan Graham got injured. Do you know your strongest eleven? Or do you have an idea of what your strongest eleven is? Or... Well, we've, ne- we've, we've never. Well, I've got. A, I've got an idea of the strongest eleven that will get us results. But I also think that we can get better than that strongest eleven. But like I say, you take Theo out of it. We we didn't know Theo's injury was going to be this bad. Jordan Graham is obviously still trying to get going. Had three or four setbacks. <clears throat> um, Jack Simpson is has just come back from illness. Jordan Brown's just come back from illness. Um, I think in this part of the season. Sean Clare was our best player. Yeah. So we've missed him. We've missed Ethan Galbraith for the patches. Um, so again, it's not just the, the, the starting eleven. It's your squad. This is about a squad. The one, the teams that have gone on really good runs at the moment in this league all have their subs, the five and six subs that are on the bench that can come on and make a real impact. Um, so yeah, we've been pretty disjointed in terms of, of squad selection throughout the season. Come on to injury uh, updates and 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 the, and the squad in just a second. But a question that I wanted to uh, to ask you was: we, we obviously we're a weekly podcast, so we look at everything in isolation rather than than big picture. And we understand, having spoken to people like Martin and 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 Kent and, and others at the board level, that they look at games in in blocks of ten, for example. How do you look at the? Do you look at the league? Uh, look at the fixture list rather and, and and say right from that next block of ten games. We expect to get X amount of points from that. Do you have a view on on that side of things, or, or do you look at it game by game as well? No, I think it's a balance between you have to obviously look at the next game, but I think also what helps is when you've got a fully fit team and a fully fit squad, you can start to plan two or three games ahead. When you obviously lose players and then you get one back and you lose the next player, that's really difficult to plan in any. In any two, five, ten game block, it's really difficult to plan. But yeah, there's certain targets that we want. We've got a certain target for remaining eight games, which will take us to the to the fifty percent part of the you know halfway through the season. Mm. Um, and I honestly believe that any any team that puts three or four wins together in this in this league will 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 leapfrog you very very tight from probably where we are to 
I mean, you look at the Lincoln game. We, there's nothing in that Lincoln game. We should win the game. We should we should go one nil up. And if you take three points off them and you put three points on us, and then one more game, we're more or less level with Lincoln. So it's it's still early days. He's very very tight. And like I say, we're going to need to go through a, a stage of the season where we put a few wins together. Um, and hopefully that's just on the horizon. You mentioned the squad, <clears throat> and we've spoken about Josh and Zach, and now two loan signings. We've obviously got six loan signings at the club. Um, I guess to talk about the other loan signings and your thoughts on them, I guess we'll start with Sonny Perkins, who I guess, from a fan perspective, struggled early on, but kind of hit a bit of form with three goals in his last four games. What, what are your thoughts on Sonny? Well, listen, it's his, it's his first real loan. He never really played Oxford. And when you bring young players in on loan, they need support. If I said to, if I said to you now that I listen to his podcast and I listen to it weekly and I find it pretty boring, and to be honest, I don't really listen to it anymore, and I spoke to several of our players and it's, it's pretty boring, and I'm surprised that you still get any viewers listening to it and, and it's not been scrapped. How does that make you feel? Not great. <laughs> well, there you go. So if I was just comment on your podcast and you don't feel great, and you start to overthink things and start to be negative, and, and then think how Sonny Perkins and the other young players, how they go on social media and you hear supporters that have never kicked a ball and say, oh, Sonny's this, Sonny's that. Sonny's a, a big talent, but he needs to get his career. By the way, I'm only joking on your podcast, don't be... I can see your face. He's a piss at the bottom <laughs> of the but this, is what we have to do. this is what we have to deal with. We, we're not just football managers. We're mums, we're dads, we're, we're parents, we are... You know, we obviously we've obviously got our own sports scientists, but a lot of young players is all mental. How they feel, how they think, how they confident. Sonny scores against Boreham Wood. He scores in the next two games. And listen, the Saturday is a non-event for, for for players like Sonny. It's about fighting. It's about scrapping. But now he's starting to see his training levels have gone up, and that's about. Listen, it happened last year with Shaq Ford. Shaq Ford had played five or six games, and our supporters are moaning about how poor he is. Shaq Ford finishes the season off. He moves for over half a million pounds to Bristol Rovers. So, it's, it's part of development of young players. Also, wow. another loanee who I think is really kind of um, really taken to Orient is Jack Curry. He's only been here a bit shorter than Sonny, but I think most yeah. of those fans have really agreed that we've really been impressed with Jack. I guess your thoughts on Jack, I guess, are pretty obvious. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. But we have to. We, Jack's coming from a different stage where he's played over 100 games for Wimbledon. He's game ready. You know exactly what you're going to get. He got a good move to to Oxford. Obviously, Oxford was promoted to the Championship. Maybe it's a little bit too soon for Jack with um, with Bennett and with Greg Lee at, at Oxford in the left back position. So, you know, I think Oxford are really pleased with his progress, the way that he's playing, the way that he's fit him. And we'll monitor that in in January. But yeah, I agree. Jack's coming and. And done really well, but I think whenever you get in a player that is ready and played over 100 games, you look at Sean Clare, he's played 300 games, there's, there's no risk, but these come at a premium and, you, and we can only afford, afford so many of them. Hence why we've gone with uh, six loan signings this year to, to obviously fill out the squad a bit. I'm assuming we, we were priced out of moves for, for more established players or more experienced players. Yeah, the, I mean, the goalkeeper one, I've, I think I've spoken to this about in an interview before, maybe with you guys before, we, we spoke to several goalkeepers because we wanted we were desperate for a permanent goalkeeper, desperate for one. But, you know, one came along, out, he was outpriced. Another came along, he's got offers from other clubs and, and, and it was just ticking through the, all the permanent ones and we just we lost out on so many that we had to go down the loan route. Is it, go no, sorry, I was just going to ask, on the fans' forum, they mentioned that one of the loan signings is likely to sign for us or we're likely to try and sign them in January a risk of asking to you to play your hand are we able to know who, who that might be or are you prepared to, to say who that might be? No, that, I mean listen, the long players that we have I think Sonny Perkins and Jamie Donnelly you know, the, the wages I mean the Premier League wages so that would be a no-go um, I don't know who the I, don't, I mean Oxford have just bought Jack Curry for a million pounds so they're not going to willing to let him go for free. So yeah, I mean, I think that's just yeah. people just that's half them ruled just, out. Yeah. yeah, just making spec making speculation. Like that. You know, it's not true. No. All right. Speaking of speculation, in I think I can figure out that Charlie Kelman might be uh, the one who might be on the market. What are your thoughts on Charlie Kelman? Because he started, he came no, again, back again. Again, we can't afford Charlie's wages. Not yet. Yeah, there's no chance. I mean, 
we'd have to pay a fee for Charlie, so that would be a no-go as well. OK. I mean, what are your thoughts on Kelman? He obviously came back to the club after a season of not being at the club. He definitely looked a bit broader, really strong, started the season really on fire, really impressed. So had a bit of a difficult spell and obviously scored against MK Dons. What are your thoughts on, um, on Charlie this season? Yeah, I mean, listen, he's, he's scored six goals this year, which is not bad so far. He could have scored, he could easily be in double figures. He, I think he admits himself that he's missed a couple of chances. I think with Charlie, and we spoke about it, a lot of it is in his head. And if Charlie Kelman doesn't overthink and he smiles, there's a proper player in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we had the, the conundrum of who do we play wide? Charlie Kelman had to suffer that playing wide at the start. We've just decided at the moment to have a bit more balance in the team and go with one out and out striker, and that has been Dan Aggie. So Kelman's come on the last couple of games. He scored, obviously, in the Blackpool game, scored against MK Don. So I think we, you know, Charlie's one that he does a lot of work with our sports scientists, and once he can stop that overthinking and play with confidence all the time, then there's a real player in there. Injury updates. We've got a couple out long term. You mentioned Jordan Graham, uh, obviously, and Sean Clare. Jordan's uh, had a couple of setbacks, um, but you named him as a substitute on Saturday. So, but, but obviously, he he didn't play. So, uh, what's the situation with him? Is he's fit and, and and good to go now? Yeah, I mean, he's not match fit because we've not. It's really difficult. He, he obviously played the the sixty minutes or so against MK Dons. I didn't think it was right to bring him on on Saturday. It was blowing a gale. It was mm-hmm. that was a game that was just waiting for a mistake. And Jordan Graham is a type of player that that wants to bring it down, that wants to play. And if you bring it down the wrong area against Stevenage, then it's within two seconds, it's in your box. So um, Jordan's got with Ollie O'Neill suspended for 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 Tuesday night. So there's an opportunity there maybe for Jordan. But you know, at the moment, I have to say that his training level is nowhere near what it was last year and the only way that we're going to get that is exposing him to minutes and, and that's been tough Paul mentioned Sean Clare um, earlier what's the on Sean when can we expect Sean back is it um, still a couple yeah, of Sean, yeah Sean won't be ready till January ok January now ok and I think I think we need to mention obviously we only mentioned five low knees and I think people might rush if we don't mention obviously Jamie Donnelly came to the club from Tottenham I think everyone was really excited again another youth prospect who's got really big reputation mm-hmm. and I think hasn't really broken through to the squad yet for for whatever reason. What what are your thoughts on Donnelly, Richie? He's a talented boy. Again, it's his first loan, and you need to you to learn other things: game management, um, using your body, winning duels, winning second balls. Which again, he's never been exposed to that playing under twenty ones football. So again, he has the potential to be a player of a real high level. You guys obviously watched Harry Kane on his first loan at Leighton Orient. You would have never said then that he would have gone on to be England's record goal scorer. Yeah. So yeah, this man. is a part of his education. I think we need more from him. We definitely need more from him to start every single week. Um, he's, he's in direct competition to play as a 10 because he wants to play as a 10 with Ethan Galbraith, even though I like Ethan Galbraith at right back. Ethan Galbraith played right back this <laughs> year 17 times, 17 times in league. Go on. You listen to this podcast, I know you do. You've made you've made I'm, a few I'm comments. Listening to quotes and if but guys, you don't study the game. I study the game. Ethan Galbraith plays in a ten in the league one game, which is a battle, and he touches the ball twenty times. If he plays right back, and we give him a freedom to go wherever he wants, he touches the ball eighty times. Yeah. Ethan Galbraith played seventeen games last year in League One at right back. We won ten of them. But you guys know better. It's fine. <laughs> Joe, I think this is I think this is a real benefit of having you on the podcast though, because like me and Paul will just react to a weekly uh, result or weekly squad. But when you're on this podcast, like you have an opportunity, I guess, to go more in depth than what you do on club media. So this is why I love having you on the podcast because you're very transparent and you're right. very honest. And you but always... again, you all but all you do is you come. I'm not listen. I'm not having a go at you. I've watched Man United today. I went to the United game, and Amarin has played eleven games at Sport in Lisbon. He win every single game 4-5 nil. He can do whatever he wants because he's got the best players. He's got all the ball and he can relax and he can just... He can play with his team because he's going to win. And if he goes one nil behind, it don't matter because he's four or five goals and he's... He comes to Man United in the Premier League and they're all over the shop today. They're all over the shop. So we have to watch games knowing that we are late and orient in League One and not a Birmingham. So we need to be really, really adaptable in a lot of the things that we do. We can't just have one... And that's why I'm really proud of the players on Saturday. Really proud against them against um, Blackpool in the, in, in the last home game. 
because I thought we, we dominated Blackpool for half an hour. We could have been two or three up. Yeah. Blackpool then changed at half-time. Mm. They've got good players for this league. A lot of them have dropped down from the Championship two years ago. And they put us under pressure. So we need to adapt to that. We change to a back three. We press them differently. Players take on the advice brilliantly. They miss a chance just after half-time, which could have brought it back to 1-1. Yeah. But then we take the game away from them in the last 20 minutes. We run all over them. And that's why I'm really proud of the players. We play a lot of, we play a lot of opposition in this league where they play wing-backs. So... When you play against wing backs, invariably, when you when you win the ball back and you push your wingers high, they then revert into a back five. So our spare players are, are our full backs. So I won't even go away from the ball. So I'm not I, I don't play a full back against the four three three, and their wing is unbelievable, and I'm worried about them. So I play Ethan Galbraith right back against a, a back five where he can go in, he's got a freedom to, to rotate with the threat that on turnover, they have no left winger stood out there. It's a left back, it's a left wing back coming from deep, so we have time to recover. And like I say, we've played 17 games last year. I think we won 10, drawn three and lost four, so it's a probably promotion form. I, I think, to be honest, we're so impressed with Ethan Galbraith. I think, uh, other than centre back, I think wherever you're going to play him, I think he's going to do a tremendous job for you. Regardless, just because yeah, and, he's and, a quality and player. I've, of course, and I've watched yeah. Ethan for a long time. And again, mm. I took Ethan Garbraith on his first loan at Doncaster. He mm. was a very young player. We had a lot, a lot of young players. <clears> and the Doncaster fans were saying exactly the same thing. Ethan's not good enough. He's not strong enough. He's not this. He's not ready. Now, for me, Ethan could be the million-pound player. He's improved that much. And that's what, you, that's what you have to go through with these young players. What happens, Richie, if you have a million-pound player who's out of contract in the summer... And you've put a contract in front of them and they don't sign. Would you get to January and go, right, we need to either offload the player, potentially, to try and get a better feed than what we would do in the summer, or do we keep him until the summer, knowing mm. you might lose him for a lesser fee, but have the contract yeah, so, under his nose? Yeah, we, we have an option on Ethan, so we're, we're secure oh, there. Okay. If it's, this Jan- if it's this January and it's a ridiculous offer that we don't yeah. feel that we can refuse, then I would never hold the player back. Mm. Mm. You know, I, but I, I think that Ethan's quite loyal. Um, with him, where he's come from and where he's got to has been pretty vast improvement over a short space of time. Um, obviously, if it's next January, then the club have got a decision to make. And yeah. so we, I'll, leave, I'll leave Martin, the finances and stuff, I'll leave that down to Martin and, and, and Nigel. So, um, yeah, we, we're covered with that. But let's just, what I don't want is Ethan to get drifted with his, with his mindset Get your head down, keep working, let's get in a better position than where we are. And if something comes along the line, then you know, let happen move real well. We've 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 sold players for, for good money in the last two years. Um, you know, if we didn't have certain buyout clauses on certain players, we would have made made a hell of a lot more. Mm. And obviously he made his full international debut during the international break as well. So that obviously adds a bit of value to, to him and obviously the experience that he's picked up from that as well is, is invaluable that he'll then bring back to us, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, when he's exposed to playing with international players, um, that can only improve his confidence. Once he trains with them and he feels that he belongs there and he can mm. he can he can deal with whatever's thrown at him, then again he's just part of him developing and his body growth, his body's now turning from a from a from a young boy to a man and you can see that development coming on. Like I say, his quality he has the ability to play higher. Yeah. Um he's one of a number of players that are out of contract uh, in the summer. Is it too early? I know we're only, well, we're late November. Is it too early to start thinking about contract extensions and offerings to, to those that are out of contract at this point? No, again, I'll leave that down to Lingy and down to the chairman. We will speak about certain players. Um, I do think it is slightly early. We're not in a situation where, you know, we have a, a Paul Smith, a Lawrence Figaro yeah. that would do... do they're on wages that we don't think they should be on, and we should be um, we should be offered a new contract with a significant increase. You know, the, the the lads that have signed new contracts in the last six twelve months have, have signed significant improvements, which happens when you go from League Two to one to one anyway. So we think we're pretty comfortable. Obviously, we don't want too many changes because every summer at the moment we're getting to having to build a new team, and we don't want that. That's difficult for a manager. Mm. Um, so yeah, as much as much continuity as possible. Every time you announce a team lineup or a team lineup is announced, we always ask for views on that team lineup, and more often than not, Zekobiero always comes up in terms of sometimes he's on bench, sometimes he's not in the squad. 
I guess give us yeah. your thoughts on I guess how you're managing <clears throat> Zek's progress um, within the squad, and I guess would you is Zek going out on loan? Maybe a possibility considering he's not in the squad at the moment. No, because our squad isn't big enough. The, the the problem we have is when we have when we bring players up from the youth team. And by the way, there's no bigger support at the football club than Zeka Burial. Don't forget, I started him in the first four games of the season. I had a lot of faith in him, starting him against Bolton, starting him against Birmingham, starting him against Charlton away. Um, but he's stuck in between that. You know, he's, he's left the youth team and we haven't got a 21. So the consistent games programme for him is, is really, really limited. Um, and I just felt that, you know, he needed... It's funny enough... It's really, it's really funny you say that because we play, we play Boreham Wood and as I'm walking out of the change room, this is brilliant from supporters. A supporter shouts at me and why is Averio not starting? I ignore him, I walk off. I bring Zek on after 60 minutes because I think the game's won and we're playing inferior opposition, we're two and up, we're dominating the game and I, and I give Zach an opportunity at half an hour. After 90 minutes, it goes into extra time and I walk to the change room and the same supporter actually shouts at me, what are you doing bringing a beer you want? Oh. Oh, uh, that made me chuckle. But oh. listen, Zach's come on, Zach, Zach's come on against, um, against Boreham Wood. He, play, he started the game against MK Duns and he needs to do more to get into the starting eleven. That's not to say that I don't have faith in him. Again, he's a very, very, very young... I think I give Zach his debut when he was 17. He's a very young player. He needs to get used to playing every single week, Saturday, Tuesday, and I think that when he did start the season, you know, he started off playing OK individually, but we struggled as a team in duels in terms of results. So then we, we, we decided to take him out, and since Pratt's has come into the team, I think Pratt's points per game is mm. touching on two points per game. So in the end, it looks like an OK decision. We want Zep to improve, and in, in, a, in a year's time, when not even a year's time, we, we need to go on, and this is not having to go down Pratt because I love him to bits, but we do need to move on from Pratt's eventually. And you look at someone like Zeg that can that can come in, Lewis Warrington the same. Um, Don Ball, who's starting, again, we, we signed Don Ball with no pre-season. So Dom's having to, to learn on a job, so to speak. And when you don't have a pre-season, it's really tough for players. He's tough for young players. Dom's an experienced campaign, and, and he, he's, I mean, he has to come off against Ball and Wood because... You know, he's struggling with, with concussion. But before that, he's actually got a touch of cramp against a non-league team. So he took his time to get going as well. January's just round the corner. We touched on it um, a little bit on it uh, a moment ago. Have you started thinking ahead to what, what recruitment business we might need to do in January to help move our, move our season up the table? Yeah, I mean, we've identified what we need. But in terms of trying to get players and answers from players, yeah, it's impossible at this stage of the season because one is, is five weeks ago till the window opens and then clubs will only make decisions on players if they can get what they want in. Mm. Um, so I, I, clubs don't like to lose players in and around January. They'd rather keep them an overload on, on certain areas and keep probably one or two more players than what they need. So... Yeah, we will identify players, whether they'll be available or not, and whether they'll be willing to come is a, is a different conversation. I think Martin Ling has, has come up, so I'll ask you the question about Martin Ling, because we always have a few questions around Martin from fans who listen. In terms of your relationship, obviously he's the director of football, you're the manager. I guess, what's your relationship like with Martin? I know it's strong, but I will we'll always ask it anyway, but in terms of your relationship with Martin and the board, as strong as ever? Well, it's, again, I don't know why people ask the question. Why should it? Why should it not be? You know, if you would have said that, if you'd have said three years ago when, you know, we potentially might go down to the National League, that in three years' time you're going to have won the league, you're going to finish 11th, and then you know what? You're going to come through some rough times and you're going to have to fight to finish 11th again. And you're going to develop players and sell players on for money. You're going to develop players like El Mazzuni and, and Shaq Ford and Sol Brin for other teams. And then you're not going to keep them. You're not going to sign them on a permanent. Mm. You're going to have to lose them. And then you're going to have to get new players and you have to go through the same cycle again. You imagine how frustrating that is for me. Mm. Well, it's funny you mentioned so, M2 because M2, obviously, Oxford, Middlesbrough, yesterday, they right? So Salbury made his championship debut and he just was on the bench for Oxford and, you know, championship football. No. Yeah, no, 100%. But it's, it's lucky I don't get as frustrated as, as, as some other people, isn't it? So deep down I get frustrated, but you know what? There's a drive and a determination in me to get my head down and just work. Mm. So my relationship with Nigel has never been better. 
Um, my, not, my relationship, and again, I'm the type of person, but it's quite, it's quite easy for me to listen to some of your negative comments on here and go, you know what, when you text me, I just go, no, I'm not coming on. Because that would be, one, hiding in the corner, but I don't get too high. When we go on, when we go in on that run last year, and get, I don't get too high. So when, when we lose a few games, I don't get too low and I don't get, let things don't get on top of me because then that can impact the players. So my relationship with the board has, has been exactly the same as it, as it has always been. Um, you know, and I, I, and I consider Nige and, and Martin not only as, as professional colleagues, but also as friends as well. So, yeah, we, listen, I, I'm black and white. I'm very honest. And um, sometimes I say things, especially in a ma after match interviews, that when you haven't had time to think or calm down. But yeah, I think me coming on here and saying the relationship is is um, as strong as ever. I think that's all you need to, to hear. Cool. I think the late great Justin Edinburgh put it uh, best once. He he never got too high with the highs or too low with the lows. And I think that's probably a good mantra for for anybody in football to have, to be honest. Because there's going to be some peaks, there's going to be some troughs, but. Uh, it's about being consistent with your behaviours. Um, so that was the kind of end of our, our questions. We had quite a lot of listener questions uh, that came in as well. Garrico7 on Twitter asked, can you please ask if, you, if Richie foresees us getting Josh Keeley on loan again next season or will we go for a permanent keeper? I don't know if that's too far ahead yeah, to think about. Yeah, no, it's a good question. But initially when, you know, when I was, a, we'd, we'd watch, we played Tottenham in pre-season, we was aware of Josh. And I spoke to the agent and the actual initial conversation was take him on a permanent. Mm -hmm. And that really was attractive to us because we knew that we had Zach on a loan and to get Josh in a permanent. But when we showed a real strong, strong interest and it was about to get done, Tottenham kind of, kind of, kind of changed it a little bit and was like, OK, well, we, can half, we can half let him go on loan here, give him a new contract, let him go on loan. So if he's successful, we get the benefits of that. And I think that's, you know, we kind of, we didn't want to go all that way and then pull out at the end. So, yeah, the question, good question. I think Josh has a lot going for him and he would definitely interest us on a, on a permanent deal. Boatsy asks about Theo Archibald. Obviously, some really sad news came out about Theo Archibald um, last week. Boatsy asks, is there any option to extend Theo's contract into next season? Yeah, again, that would be left to Martin because, you know, we... we we, we didn't know this was going to happen, but there was a chance that this could happen. So I think the club, like I say, Nigel and, and Martin are brilliant people. So they decide, we decided to give give um, give Theo a, a new contract on the same terms as of his, of his existing contract, knowing that there might be a risk of him not playing this season. So I think that was you know a brilliant gesture by the board. I'm devastated for Theo um, because he's a massive... He's a massive part of what we've done over the last three years. He's, he's a player that, you know, you can press, you can play with a high tempo, he gets you assists, he gets you goals. Um, and, he's a, and he's a brilliant influence in the, tra in the, in the changing room as well. So been a, he's been a massive loss for us. Um, and we, and we want to look after him. But we also have to say that he takes a significant amount out of my budget with, with not getting, obviously, anything at the end of it. Yeah, that's fair, understandable. So I said that to a couple of friends that it's, 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 a, it's a way that we, we could have a player uh, come in and, and, and potentially starting, but he is, a great, he is a great guy. We're in touch with him as well and we wish him well. Um, Adam, Joseph, Adam H. Joseph, 75, said, I'm going to preface this question by saying that I think Rich is one of the best O's managers in modern history. However, our attacking threat from corners is next to nothing. What does Richie put this down to? Well, listen, he's been there really we've worked on a lot of things obviously we've had uh, several coaches that have, have tried to do it obviously Alan McCormack is is in charge of the attacking set plays at the, at the moment but for, but for me the, the two most important things are the quality of the delivery which for me has not been good enough which I tried my best to sign a set piece specialist in 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 the summer someone who who over the last four or five years has proven that getting assists not only from open play, but mainly from from set plays. But we lost out on on two, um, and then the aggression that you want to sh show in terms of your movement and getting across your man or being physical with your man, and and they're two areas that we haven't been good enough. It's a very very justified question, and that's not just been this year. It's been 
we have some little spells where we, we actually really good from set plays, but then over a period of time, yeah, we've not been we've not been good enough. But you look at you look at someone like West Ham last year, they're brilliant from set plays because you have Ward Prowse that is is putting it on the money every single time and consistently we've not been good enough at that. Um I have to say that our defensive set plays which would have been I think they're the best in the league this year, so that's been a positive. But yeah, totally, totally justifiable question, and, and I agree with what he's saying. They've not been good enough. Pandemonium eighteen eighty one asks, where does Richie feel he needs to improve personally as a manager? Is it tactically? Is it as a people person? No, I think tactically we have to. Like I say, we'd I'd love to have a set way of playing every single week, and never going to have to change. But if you if you play the same every week against some of the opposition that we we play against, you'll you'll get cut open. Um, so you look at you'll have to look at our defensive record. We've conceded eighteen this year. Eight of them was in the first four games. So in the last eleven games, we've only conceded ten goals. You know, three of them was against Wickham. So we're getting a lot of our out of possession stuff right. We you know you look at the th- three goals that we did concede against against um, against Wickham. Every single one is a turnover. And that's really difficult to, to get back in your shape, to get organised. It's been a quick turnover. <coughs> and within a few seconds, the ball's been been hit on our goals. So from open play, when we don't give the ball away in stupid areas, our defensive play's been really, really, really good. Um, and, and again, the attacking play, a lot of it comes down to individuals, you know, 1v1. Can you can you get shots off? Can you be expressive? Can you be imaginative? Um but yeah, like you say, when you when you're manager of, of one of the clubs that are, are not in the top six in this league, you have to be adaptable. You have to fight and scrap for every point. So I think that adaptability is one of one of our strengths, and the players have took that on really well. You picked up a booking yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, and you covered it with Dave Victor in in the post match. Are you able to appeal bookings at all as a manager? No, I mean I've watched it back. I've I didn't do anything. I appealed for a decision. I watched Alex Ravel and. And Scott Cuff, but their assistant manager, they've done it probably four or five times more than me. So, mm. so there's probably a, an X on my back, I understand that. So I do think it's a little bit harsh. The Orient Way asks, what is your favourite thing about this year's group of players? I, I, I think the resilience at not one point have we ever... Have we ever... Of our, I ever sense that the players are not ha- happy or... There's a downbeat mood in the training ground. We've all, we've we've recovered from setbacks well, and um, like I say, the last the last four games, even though it's included the defeat at Wickham, we've got seven points from them. We need to just you know we need another run of seven points from three or ten points from four, and that will get us even more in the pack. So um, yeah, I think the resilience and and the belief. There's still a growing group. Again, we, some of the some of the players have not played with each other yet because of certain injuries and what have you. So I said it last year. And I'll say it this year, the longer the season goes on, the better we will get. Who is one player from last season you wish was still in the team? I think that's an easy one because I think Idris was a player that we tried to sign several occasions. We, it's very, really difficult now to get players that, that win the ball back. You know, everybody in 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 under-21s football or developing players, you ask them where they want to play in midfield, it's a six. And if they want to play a six, they want to get on the ball and make the ball, make the, make the team tick over. If it's an eight, they want, to, they want to get on the ball. If it's a ten, they want to get on the ball. You know, there's very few players now that are brilliant at getting the ball back. And I think Idris, if he can develop his other side of the game, like moving the ball quicker, seeing pictures quicker, playing one and two touch, especially when you go up to the championship because that player's... Mm-hmm. A little bit quicker, a little bit sharp, and I spoke to him on many occasions about that. But in terms of that possession and winning the ball back, he's a, he's a very, very good player. Uh, a Twitter handle, who's an Orient fan, but is a Scolzy 23 od says, how much work does Richie feel he needs to do for us still to be hard to beat, but have a bigger threat when we get forward and create more chances from the possession we do have? Well, you're, you're, ever, you're ever working. You're working as hard as possible. Um but when it comes to strikers, it's really difficult to coach strikers because you, you identify certain weaknesses in in opposition. You identify certain movements that can hurt centre-backs. But then with strikers, it's certain feelings, it's certain timing of movements that, that they need to feel themselves. Um, so 
yeah, we, we're working with Kelman, we're working with Aggie, we're working with Perkins, we're working with DJ all the time. And I think once they get into to, to top gear, we've seen little signs of it. We've seen, obviously, Stockport away, Blackpool at home, where we could have scored five or six. Um, you know, we, we, we want more from them and we think they're capable of more. Doyle Hooper asks, would love to hear Richie talk about in-game coaching. It's interesting to hear you give instructions to players during the game, but sometimes players look to you for instructions on set pieces. How difficult is it to balance trust in the players with the need to coach in play? Yeah, it's something that I don't want to do. In terms of the set plays, they're not, they're not looking at me, they're looking at Alan because they just want reminders of where they should be. They should already know where they be. But sometimes the, the, the players are obviously learning, getting used to certain things, and we need to remind them. In, in terms of, listen, I, I managed Swindon, and I never sat, I never, I managed Swindon for 40 odd games in, in a season, and never, I never sat on the sideline. I, I watched from above, and I would go down once or twice in the first half, maybe once or twice in, in the second half, because it was a, I had the best players in the league, we scored four or five most weeks. We we had goal scorers. With two strikers, scored forty between them, and it was a really fluid machine. But and it was similar. The in coaching wasn't as much in the League Two season because we had better players. We're still trying to get players that are getting acquitted to this level, you know. And I think the in coach in the in coaching. If I mean go and, go and watch Pep Guardiola. Go and watch these top guys do it. And listen. Maybe Pep wasn't doing it as much the other day because he got beat 4 0. But, you know, Pep's actually going on after games and he's coaching the opposition players sometimes. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's something that the players over time will, will get better in it. And then the need for us to, to track the micro manage, if you like, we, then we don't need to do. It. But in certain times, yeah, I think we need our support. I've, set, we, I've watched you a few times. We sit in the south stand behind the goal to your right as you stand in the dugout and we've watched you quite a few times. You're quite um, active from the touchline. Is that because they're not following instructions well enough or because you've seen no, something no. different that you no, need to no. get your message no. across? Or Not at all. So when, when we work on... Let's say we're working on playing out. You know, we will identify two, three things of the opposition and we will tell the, the guys how to play out and what movements to make and it'll be going really, really well. Well then, what happens? The opposition change. So with experience, you start to work certain things. I go, well, they've changed now. Sometimes with younger players, they keep trying to do the same things but the opposition have changed. So that's not going to work. Mm. So it's up to us and sometimes you imagine trying to shout on when there's thousands of people making a noise and the players can't hear you. You know, I've, I've played 700 games. I've managed for, for, for over 300 games. My experience tells me that, OK, if he moves there and he does this, we can play out in another way with the way that the opposition have, have adapted. So that's the, that's the story behind that. Sometimes mm. the players, you know, we set out a certain way and it's working, but then the opposition change. Good answer. All right. Yeah. Like okay. it. We've got a few questions from the forum before we let you go, Richie. Not only left to face now. We've got Red in the face, who says, thinking back to August, to what extent did you anticipate just how difficult the first third of the season was going to be for the team? Well, I think everybody, when the fixtures came out, everybody kept telling me how tough the, f the first three games was. Um, but again, you look at this league, it's, it's tough. So the, the guys that have come down from the Championship, big clubs, big budgets, the guys that have come up from League Two, probably we couldn't have handpicked three worst teams in terms of size of budgets to come up. And then you look at the the, the mid-block of clubs that we, that we finished in and around last year, Charlton have had another go to an existing squad that was huge anyway. Bristol Rovers, I think Bristol Rovers has spent about mm. over at one and a half million on transfer fees. Um, you look at Wickham, had a right goal, load of experienced players. So yeah, it, it, it wasn't going to be easy this year. It was, it was definitely going to be harder. So we, we was well aware of the, of the challenge ahead. Like I say, we're probably a couple of wins short of being where we want to be. He also asks about um, our goal return. Five goals in our last eight League One games is uh, a disappointing return. Why do we struggle so much in front of goal? That's the second question. Well, so we're, we're trying to get goal scores from different areas of the pitch. I do think attacking set plays, we need to score more goals because in that, in that eight-game block, as you just mentioned, if we score two goals from set plays, we might have 
five or six more points. Mm. You know, but the answer to your questions is players need to score goals. So, you know, we give them the freedom in the final third to, to do whatever they want, to make movements how they feel. Um, so, I think that... And, and again, we also have to think that Dan Aggie missed a large part of last season. Um, so, he's... Dan Aggie in the first six games didn't look like the Dan Aggie of, of old. Dan Aggie in the last six or seven games looks like he's getting back up to speed. So, yeah, well, like I said, our attacking is a work in progress. We're, we're a new team. Um, again, Ollie O'Neill comes in last year. Outstanding. Do we expect him just to keep on that trajectory, to keep going like that? No, he's going to have a lull. And I think that Ollie O'Neill had a lull, and now Ollie O'Neill looks, he looks fitter, he looks stronger and looks back to his best, so we, we expect in the coming weeks more goals from him. Great to hear. Another question from the forum was, how many transfer windows do you anticipate needing before we are ready to challenge in League One? Well, I, uh, I spoke to Ian Everett last year when we played them away. He had overturned 120 players since their promotion oh. from League Two. Wow. <laughs> and, and spent millions. Mm. Yeah. So I don't think there's any answer to that. I think the, the, the hardest thing is Every window or every summer, we lose our best players. So, you know, you look at someone like a Bolton, I'm just using them as an example. You know, they can keep their best players because they have the financial power to do it. Um, and primarily, they're not, you know, as, as reliant as a loan system as what we are because our loan, our loan system, the way we've used a loan system, the way Lingy's done it over the last three or four windows has been brilliant. Hence, the players are now playing the championship, some of them. Um, you know, Bolton can keep their best players and add two or three and then keep their best players and add two or three. Whereas what we've done in probably the last definitely two summer windows, you know, we lose we lose Hector Cipriani. Again, everybody tells me that Hector Cipriani is not good enough to play for us, you know, and, and our fans have a go at Hector Cipriani. Hector will probably move for two or three million in the next window. If he doesn't move on a on a Bosman, then he's you go to to a top top championship club. We lose Hector, we lose Al Mazuna, we lose Shaq Ford, we lose Paul Smith, we lose Lawrence Vigaru. Whereas a club like Bolton would have probably kept them, you know, and they've just added layers and layers on top. So, um, and the players that we've recruited are good enough. It's just that we need to get that continuity back, the way of playing, the understanding of our game, and obviously get them used to League One football, which takes time. A few questions came in from another uh, poster, Oreo, on the forum, who said, we find ourselves in the bottom four. What have you been most disappointed with this season so far on and off the pitch? We may have covered it briefly in other questions. Yeah, I, th- I think the start. And then and then more so the stop-start nature of the season, where it's been, you play three games, you international break, you play four games international break then you play one league game then you've got an FA Cup game then I think after you've played the FA Cup game you've got an international break so yeah the stop start nature of the league um, the half 12 kickoffs. I think we've had two or three of them it's, we're just trying to get used to it now and hopefully like I say this one there'll be no excuses there's, there's no international breaks and we've got four months where we can hopefully get as everyone as fit as possible the medical team are, are working hard to make sure that everybody stays fit and hopefully in the next four months we can keep it and, and climb up the table. You've mentioned um, Tuesday night games in some post-match interviews, and we all know kind of the trouble we've had this season. In the next two weeks, we've got two Tuesday night games at Brisbane Road, haven't we? So I guess how do you approach the Tuesday night games from, I guess, a different perspective than what you would from a Saturday game? Because we feel it in the stands, and I think when we had Darren Pratty on two weeks ago, he said he can feel it on the pitch, a big difference between the Saturday and the Tuesday. So I guess from your perspective, you must feel it as a manager, but how do you negate that or how do you get around that yeah don't, don't think about it it's a game of football 11 the 11 under the lights it should be a brilliant evening to, to play and, and watch football you know and I have to say that our last Tuesday game was Rotherham at home mm. where we were tentative for the first 20 minutes mainly because you know they were striving for a win we were striving for a win but I think after that our performance was really really good and we beat a championship at home so we beat a relegated championship team at home so enjoy it you know, and try and embrace these Tuesday nights. And it's not, again, we're overthinking, oh, we're playing at home on a Tuesday night. No, we're playing We're playing a, gr- a brilliant football club in Huddersfield who, again, have been relegated from the Championship last year. You know, and, and let's embrace it. Let's turn up on Tuesday night and let's go head-to-head with, with a big football club, enjoy it and, 
and take three points off them. Obviously, Rotherham had a bit of extra spice because of our history with Steve Evans, but obviously Tuesday night we welcome back former old Josh Caroma, so that will be interesting to see uh, how he performs if he's even in their squad. I don't know if he, he started did. on Saturday, mate. He started, yeah. right, there you go. Um, Richie, thanks so much. Really appreciate your, your time this evening. One last thing before we let you go. Um, just a message for the Orient, Orient fans. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, it, there's been a little bit of negativity over the last, probably not a couple of weeks, probably the last couple of months, to be honest. And I think it's a small minority, um, and I understand why. But please support the players. If they ever thought this journey was going to be smooth without bumps in the road, then then they, they don't live in the real world. You look at every, you look at someone like Wickham that are going really well now. How long have they took to get in this position? They took three or four years to get back into a, a, a position where they got relegated in the Championship and they're striving to get back into the playoffs. You look at clubs like Bolton, who I've mentioned before, they've been in this league for five years now, I think, four, four years. It's a really, really tough league, so stick with us. I love them all to bits. We've had some brilliant times and I want some brilliant times in the future. But for me, it's not... And I, say, I think I've seen his quote um, maybe a couple of weeks ago. It's not the journey and it's not the destination that is the most important thing. It's the people who are with you along that journey. So we've had a brilliant journey so far. And in these tough times, you remember who sticks by you and who tries to, you know, cloud as what has gone on and what is going to come in the future. So, like I say, I love every one of them to death. We've had some brilliant times. We've got three or four months now to the next international break. Freezing cold nights, freezing cold days in... November, December, January, brilliant. The yellow balls are out. I don't think we've lost a game with the yellow balls. I think mm. we've played Good stat. three or four games with the yellow balls and we've 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 not lost. So if they keep the volume up at home, keep followers away, he was brilliant. Again, in a really poor game the other night the other day against Stevens, but I thought our supporters were brilliant. Um and stick with us because when this when this club is won, then it is more special and it's 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 easier to to gather that forward momentum. So that was our chat, nearly an hour with manager Richie Wellens. Richie, thanks so much for, again for giving up your evening chatting to us. We really appreciate your honesty, your transparency. I think we're really blessed at this football club. We had the fans forum in the week. You've got transparency and honesty from, from board level and, and here we have the first team manager coming on a fan podcast yeah. to talk about everything that you know, fans ask. We didn't have enough time really to go through every single question that we got sent but if you sent a question and we didn't ask it we're sorry but thanks to everyone for taking the time uh, to do so um, it is I don't know many other League One podcasts you're in a WhatsApp group with with others we know other podcasters they don't get that level of access so George uh, and Tom thank you for arranging that and um, we're a bit sport in that regard yeah we very much are and Richie's always good value when he comes on the pod always tells it like it is always gives good context behind um his decisions are very happy to have him on. Uh, yeah, like thanks uh, yeah. to the media team. As Paul said, obviously, I think most people know this. There is a media timetable, so we can't speak to you know Anyone. people at the club as much as what we'd like to, as much as you'd like to hear them. So, you know, we have to respect the way the club rolls those out. But always good to hear from Richie, and obviously, the next interview will hopefully be fairly fairly soon. Yeah, and also he pushes back as well. I like that because like we're fans talking to him. Like there's things that go on that we don't know about that goes on. He's with the players five, six days a week. Yeah. He knows their thought process. He knows them. Like we don't. We get to see him for ninety minutes uh, on a Saturday afternoon or a Tuesday evening. So obviously our views and opinions are somewhat limited, comparative to him. Uh, but he pushes back. He gives examples, yeah. and 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 I like that. I like that. He's not just sitting there going, "Yeah, you're right, guys. Yeah, you're right, guys." Or "No, you're wrong. You're out of order. You're bang out of order. You shouldn't say that." Nothing like that. We're all entitled to our opinions. He understands that. He respects that. He has the. They have the right of reply at any point. So, no, it's great. He's it's tremendous. We're, we're very lucky that, that he wants to come on. Because he said quite easily, he could have said, no, I've listened to your podcasts. And do you know what? Don't agree with 90% of what you say. I think you've been a bit unfair towards me and the players. <laughs> he could do. Other yeah. managers, I'm sure. I, I know other managers... I know I, I, we did an interview. I can't remember the fuck the podcast who it was. They were due to have the manager on that that week that the previous weekend, but they'd lost, and the manager said, "No, no, no, I don't, yeah, I don't want to go on." Absolutely, yeah. But Richie wouldn't do that, 
and he could quite easily go, do you know what? You talk a load of old nonsense. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not coming on your podcast. Well, I, he think could, it, I think it's evident. It's, it doesn't have to, because it's, it's Sunday night. It's his own time. I think it's evident that he listens and he disagrees with a few of the views that have been said that's uh, fine. on the podcast. But yeah, it was, but that's fine. it's good to, you know, it's yeah. good to, it's good to hear a manager listening to a fan led media and, and being in tune with the club so once yeah. again thanks to Richie and the media team um, for getting this interview sorted so let's move on let's the supporters club <laughs> alright we are going to Wigan On the well I'm not going to Wigan but the supporters <laughs> club are going to Wigan Saturday the 7th of December this one kicks off at half 12 another half 12 kick off right coaches for this one leave at 6 in the morning it's a very early start it's going to cost adults 42 quid Concessions 39 and kids 21. Oh, six kid. That's a very early oh. start. Remember, those prices do not include your match day ticket. If you want to book for that one, you can visit the Supporters Club. There's two matches this week at home, so you can visit pre and post match. Or you can call the travel line on 07507-539-579. Indeed, you can. So, a couple of pieces of AOB. Um, you may or may not be aware there is a new social media application out there. It's called Blue Sky. It's um, set up by the guy that started Twitter, Jack Dorsey. Um, it is different, uh, slightly, uh, but a lot of it is very much the same. So, there's a lot of... Um, uh, ease of use and continuity if you're a Twitter or X user. So we are on Blue Sky now. Just go on to Blue Sky and uh, download Orient Outlook podcast or Orient Outlook as I think we are. Uh, yeah, handle. give us a follow. Orient and Outlook. give us a follow on there. We will be posting on there. Um, we have no plans to stop posting on Twitter. Uh, no, it's very important to say Twitter is our main account and it's something that we won't stop doing. But we had a few requests to join Blue Sky. Obviously, there's been a mass exodus of people, uh, of people Twitter. leaving Twitter because of all the political views and whatever else of Elon Musk. Blue Sky is an alternative. I mean, it's been going for years, but no one's been using it because everyone's been happy with Twitter. Essentially. No, because it's been invite only up until February this year. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. while well, they tested it. They didn't well, want to release it to them. Apparently, this is what I'm told. There's a small Orient audience. It's September. building. I think the Orienteer are on there. The Supporters Club are on there. Loft are on there. The actual club is in there, but haven't posted yet. We are on there. So if you are on Blue Sky, give us a follow. And if you're not on Blue Sky, but are getting bored of Twitter... Um, go on Blue Sky yeah, yeah absolutely very p- uh, sad piece of AOB uh, yeah. from the last week as we were saddened to hear the news uh, of the passing of James McMahon who used to sit uh, around us in the South Stand uh, very sad news James McMahon um, had his own podcast well a music podcast that was really good really successful it was a bit of a face back in the day when we started this podcast as well yeah he was yeah. Um, so really sad news there. Yeah, he was just slightly younger uh, than us so really sad news we wish yeah. uh and send our condolences uh, to James' family and uh, friends. Really sad news there. Yeah, we do. Uh, another Orient family member lost. So the week, that, the, the fortnight that was yeah. as it stands, we haven't podcasted for a couple of weeks now. Happy Monday, the 11th of November at 11am on the 11th day of the 11th month. We will remember them. Lovely stuff. The club announced our away game at Peterborough on Saturday, the 18th of January has been moved. We'll kick off at half 12 as it's selected for TV coverage. Worth pointing out that the Sky and the EFL have confirmed all televised fixtures for the first two months of 2025, and that's the only game that impacts us. Good to hear. Pleased to know we've got a few 12:30 kickoffs in December, mind, but in terms of the first couple of months of 2025, that's that's the only one. I think if we beat Oldham, Birmingham City away will be moved. Moved, yeah. On the you're Saturday, right. you're yeah, right. which obviously that's going to be a big away game because obviously. We'd want to go there. Everyone yeah, will yeah. want to go to that That's one. Right? Keep an eye on that one. I think Birmingham are also in action. So obviously if they win as well, um, that will get moved. All right, Tom James was named in the League One team of the week following his performance uh, the previous Saturday against Blackpool. That feels like ages ago. Well, a belated well done to Tom James on that one. Indeed. So to Hue Tuesday then, the 12th of November, the club announced a date has now been confirmed for the second round FA Youth Cup at home to Whitehawk, which would which took place last Tuesday, the 19th of November. Uh, that kicked off at 7 o'clock. We'll cover that shortly. We will, but the main feature of that Tuesday was our trip to MK Dons, which we are going to cover very briefly. The team was announced at 6pm with Hemming in goal, James, Cooper, Happy and Curry at the back, mm. Warrington, Obiero <coughs> and Don Lee, Graham, Perkins and Kelman making up the 11, with Phillips, Sweeney, Beckles, Prattley, DJ, O'Neill and Adji on the bench. For me, that was a bit of a stronger uh, lineup than what I thought, but I think it shows you how seriously Richie is taking the competition. You know, something you want to progress in, the further you progress, the more money you get, and the more 
um, profile the club gets so why not I think it was a must win game going into it yeah. I think one defeat and one win on penalties yeah so we needed the two points I think uh, there as well um, I thought Sweeney and DJ might get a start on this to give some of the first choice players a bit of a rest but I respect the fact that we're taking it yeah. that seriously with a with a full strength side so no fair play uh, for that one Hutley Thomas tweeted us and said good balance nice to see some of the ones that haven't played in the team we need to win by two so let's do it yeah Jamie Ray 72 it's a decent lineup that should be good enough to to get the result. Yeah, so the match kicked off on a chilly night in an empty M- stadium MK in the final O's Group game in the BSN Bristol Street Motors, which changed names. We'll cover that in a minute <laughs> as well. Uh, meaning that only a win would do to get through to the knockout stages. All right, we took the lead in the sixth minute after one of the defenders for MK Don slipped. He divvied. Charlie Kelman stole the ball, slipped in past the MK Don's keeper. 1-0. Yeah, fast forward then to the 21st minute. Sonny Perkins doubled our lead and scored his third goal in three games as Charlie Kelman turned provider. He picked up the ball in the middle of the pitch, superbly found Perkins, who was onside. Perkins drove into the box, tried to round the keeper. Keeper made a save, but the ball did bounce kindly to Sonny and he slipped the ball into the net to make it 2-0. Yeah, all right. Hendry pulled a goal back for the host in the 33rd minute as he struck a superb strike from the edge of the box, beating him in game on. 2-1 to the O's. Yeah, I think that's a superb strike. A few have said that Hemming's position was wrong and if he was a yard or two further back, he'd have made that save. But is what it is. We'll skip to the second half now, really. We'll go uh, into the third minute of additional time and 30 seconds prior to missing an arguably easy, op- <laughs> easier opportunity, Dan Ajayi scored our third. After a ball over the top, found him in plenty of space. He drove towards goal, shot the ball past the keeper to make it 3-1, which is eventually how the game finished to ensure that we made the draw for the next round of this trophy. Love it. All right, Richie Wendlis' post-match interview is on the club's YouTube channel. Uh, we're not going to talk about it. My views, short and sweet. Happy to be in the next round into yep. the knockout stages. Good to see 2-2 two two now for Kelman and 3-3 three three for Sunny. And three four. wins on the bounce. Yeah, happy days. Yeah, agree. Absolutely. We so you, move on to the next round yeah. and, and hopefully, look, I know people aren't overly impressed with its B-team boycott malarkey, but for me, it's a good it's a good run out for, for players that don't get enough minutes. It's competitive. There's something to win. Um, and it's a cup competition that we don't normally do overly well in. So it'd be nice if we had a bit of a run. If we get to Wembley, I guarantee you, not everyone who's boycotting, but most who boycott will end up at Wembley if we yeah, get there. So fingers right. crossed we do. Yep, absolutely. We had quite a few views that came into this, so we'll read a few of them now. But just because we read them, it doesn't mean that we agree with them. Neil Langhorn said, not quite sure what to make of that. Great for 25 minutes, then too passive and let them into it. We'll take it, though. Keep some momentum going, I guess. Lovely underscore oriented. Always good to get a win for confidence, regardless of the competition. I'm surprised we had so much support. Had about 70% of the home fans. Boggs Dolex one said, winning is a great habit and long may it continue. Could have been more as well. O's fan base thinks a great first 30 minutes then one average shot, one goal and we go a bit wobbly. Had two disallowed though and missed a sitter so could have strolled it. Graham looked fitter, Perkins getting more confident and Donnelly was Donnelly. James O'Hagan said, that doesn't sound like a compliment. James O'Hagan <laughs> said, another solid performance. The real test will be a stronger team than what we've faced in the past 10 days but we should be confident after the last two wins. It took a minute but Happy Perkins is finally showing what the committee saw in him. And the final word of MK Don's away goes to Orient Fan TV. He said, the most pleasing thing about tonight was the forwards all scoring again. Confidence must be sky high for them. Not a lot of fans like this cup for obvious reasons, but a cup run is a cup run. <clears throat> International break has come at the wrong time for us, I feel. But well done to all involved. So that concludes that Prediction League update, though. Well done, Rainbow Sailor and Casey Adams. You correctly predicted 3-1. Extra special well done to RobJB1974 and Wheeler underscore 6, who correctly predicted a scoreline and a scorer, so you, one scorer, so you get four points. But Theo Archibald, Enriched NM, Jamie PD, LOFC, Jason Kilby, 5. Take a bow. You all correctly predicted 3-1, and you got two of the scorers, so you all get five points. We'll do a top-of-the-table roundup later in this podcast. So well we, done, you guys. Yeah, really good. All right, live podcast. We've got a new follower on Blue Sky, Bazaar73. Welcome to the Orient Outlook podcast on Blue Sky. You get a shout-out as you follow us live whilst recording. Wednesday, the 13th of November, the club announced that Charlie Pegram has now joined at Tunbridge Angels on a three-month loan deal. He was at Welling earlier in the season. So good luck, Charlie. Go get him, Tiger. Absolutely. And hope you have a great three months there. Indeed. Tuesday the 14th, nothing to report. So let's move on. All right, Friday 15th of November, the club announced that ladies manager Danny Martin has left his role with immediate effect. Danny put out a short um, statement on social media. <clears throat> he said, my journey at Leighton Orient has been fantastic and one I will always be proud of. It feels like the right time for me to step away, to spend more time with my family 
and enjoy watching my daughters play this beautiful game. I'd like to thank the fans for their unwavering support since I joined and I hope this club can go on to achieve great things. Yeah, I wish you all the best. <coughs> Danny, I know you've achieved great things with the ladies' side. Wildstone announced, uh, sorry, moving on, Wildstone announced that Sam Howes has returned to us following an injury he picked up uh, last week, which will also mean his loan spell will come to an early end. And I have to say, the cu- the the announcement that Wildstone made was very, very complimentary yeah. about Sam. Obviously, we got him from Wildstone, so they know him, and he'd done quite well for them. I know, I think they're at the bottom end uh, of the National League table, so at the wrong end of the table, but he put in some very important he did. Uh, performances for them. So, uh, And I think I saw a picture of Sam Howes. He'd taken a picture of his leg. He'd had a procedure done, so he's now all strapped up. So we wish you a full and speedy recovery, Sam. Yeah, get well soon, Sam. Dan Happy on the Friday uh, was announced as the player ambassador for the Mishugano. So, well done, Dan. Good job for the Friday. <laughs> that's the yeah, that's the Jewish supporters group that was created uh, very recently. Uh, Ethan Galbraith was an unused substitute in Northern Ireland's 2-0 home win uh, against Belarus. And for me, that's the third game in a row he's now been an unused sub. It's going to get better for Ethan Galbraith, don't it, you worry. It does, but I wrote that at the time. So I was a bit like, what's the point of, like, uh, what's the point of going? Like, if you're going to get called up for your country, you're going to go whether you played or not. But I just can't help but think that he's travelled all these miles, trained and all that kind of stuff with other people rather than with us. I get it. You wouldn't turn it down. Absolutely. Well done, Eve and Galbraith. On Saturday the 16th of November, the Young O's win Youth Alliance League action. We were at Cambridge and we took the lead in the 18th minute. It's Hanbury cut the ball back to Divine Samuel who made it 1-0. The lead was short-lived as the host equalised in the 24th minute and despite both teams creating chances, no further goals as the points were shared. So well done there to the Young O's for their points. Yeah, although the O's weren't in action, there were a number of League One games played, but as none of the teams below us won their matches, we remained in 20th position. Yeah, we certainly did. There's a few bigger teams playing, actually. It's quite surprising. Bolton played, and a few like the ones you'd expect who would have been called off like were actually in action. So yeah. it's been a bit of a busy League One calendar that weekend. All right, Sunday, the 17th of November. As always, we get an update from LOFC Women. Dot com. So last Sunday, the O's ladies played against Camden and Islington United, a fellow Greater London Premiership club, better known as Candy. Oh, I like what they've done there. It's very clever. Yeah. This was a second round tie in London's Capital Cup competition, and Candy haven't won a single game since goodness knows when. They have lost all 20 league games last season, and have lost all seven so far this year, and a 5-0 defeat to a new Leighton Orient side meant they keep their record intact. <laughs> Not a record they really wanted to keep, but first, uh, four first-half goals starting in the 10th minute pretty much demonstrated the gulf between the two sides. The second half saw a free-flowing game, but as contest as a contest, it was really already over. A hat-trick by American star player Stephanie McCaffrey and two from fans' favourite Portugal's Lillian Almeida were the high points, but it was mostly one-way traffic through the game. Got to hand it to the folks at Candy. Many teams would have called it days called it days long ago but they continue the good fight good international presence there for the ladies America and Portugal from the touchline it looked as though O's female development officer Olivia Worsford was calling the shots the starting 11 included four new recruits Sophie Kelly Jade Keogh Jimmer Baker and Carly Balfour all highly rated and experienced players according to the man in the know Larry Peterson for LOFCWomen.com man on the touchline who said they looked bloody good there you go uh, that covers the ladies then. So we move on to last week, the 18th of November. Ethan Galbraith started well, hey, he for Northern Ireland. He played 89 minutes in their two-all draw away at Luxembourg as they topped their nation league, Nations League group. That's such a complex oh, that's ridiculous. Um, arrangement that they've got there. I can't even tell you how England get on, and never mind Northern Ireland. But they've done it. They're in there. They've topped their group and they're through to the next stage shall we say yeah well done Tuesday the 19th of November the youth team were in FA Youth Cup action second round at home to Whitehall lined up with Freddie Norman in goal Rhys Jussie Andrewan Hajini Eddie Wright Aaron Archibald Philip Chenedu Aaron Sterling Dan Carter Devine Samuel and Abdi Mohammed Zach Hanbury made up the starting 11 yeah he certainly <coughs> did Zach Hanbury put the O's ahead in the 21st minute Dan Carter extended our lead 14 minutes later and Divine Samuel added a third in the 39th minute as the half ended with the O's in a commanding 3-0 lead. Abdi Mohammed made it 4 in the 51st minute, Adnan Hajini made it 5 in the 65th minute, and Divine Samuel bagged his brace, and Orient 6 in the 68th minute. But White Hawk were awarded a penalty in the 73rd minute, but Freddie Norman stepped up and saved the spot kick as the O's saw the, group, saw the game out to win 6-0 and progress into the third round. Superb from the young O's. Well done, chaps. Absolutely, well done. However, there was some bad news. It's in the evening... 
Theo Archibald took to his Instagram account and announced that he has suffered a setback to his left knee during his recovery from his anterior cruciate ligament injury, which would need further surgery. And he also confirmed that he wouldn't be back this season. Yeah, so Theo said, I had been feeling good and was beginning to get excited to get playing again. The situation has changed again and it's a tough one to take. But your support and love for the last eight months has been what has driven me into darker times and I appreciate it a lot. This is terrible news and we wish Theo a full and speedy recovery. We're heartbroken for him because he was making such good progress. Len M4 tweeted us and said, I hope we can still have a decent he can still have a decent career when he comes out of the out of the end of this, a class player. Ian Hutchinson 08 so gutted for Theo. He was looking forward to him coming back and giving the whole team a much needed lift. Hopefully we'll be like a new signing next season. Best of luck with the operation and recovery, Theo. Yeah, Gorillas1985 said, definitely need a new winger in January now. Shame for him. I'm sure the club will support him. Arcoral1972 said, he's most probably done now. Football-wise, can't see him kicking a ball at this level again. Sadly, we have to move on. I hope you're wrong, Rob. Really <coughs> hope you're wrong. <coughs> Casey Adams, LOFC said, unfortunately, that's probably the last time we'll see him in an OSHA. He epitomises everything an Orient fan expects of an Orient player to be. Plays with passion, gives it his all. And showed loyalty when leaving Lincoln. Absolutely gutted for him. We did ask Richie about that, obviously, so just refer back to that question. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we love Theo Archibald. (coughs) I'm first and foremost wishing him the best uh, in his recovery. All right, Wednesday, the 20th of November. Quiet day at the club. No news to report, so let's move on. Yep, Thursday, the 21st of November, there was a fans' forum that took place. It was streamed live on the club's (coughs) YouTube channel at 7 o'clock. The main talking points were. Yeah, okay, we're going to cover very briefly the main points. Games being moved to a Tuesday. It actually looks like we're going to have the same number of Tuesday night games this season as last season. However, they've all been front loaded uh, into the front, and obviously the international postponements haven't helped. Yeah. Scouting and recruitment. Basically, we need to do better. Yeah, I think I think that's the first time actually. Nigel was, I mean, those were Nigel's words, right? So, I don't think Nigel ever come out and said those so publicly before. So that caused a lot of uh, debate and a lot of posts on the forum. Uh, one of the loans, which we've obviously mentioned in an interview to Richie, has been confirmed as signing permanently. I guess we all presumed it would be Kelman, but it sounds like it would actually be Keeley. I would guess. I don't know. I've got no idea. Keeley or Kelman for me? Well, we said because he said he said he said no to Kelman. That's what he says publicly. Okay, but, all right. But for me, I don't know if Kel- how long Kelman's got on his contract. Out in the summer. Out in the summer. So he's not, they're not going to get much of a fee for him. I know he's under 24, so they'll, it'll be a Bosman. It'll be a tribunal ruling. So that he's not in their squad, number one. Um, yeah, for me, it'd be... Like, we're not going to match Donnelly. We're not going to match Perkins. Um, we're not going to get Curry. Um, Hemming. It's unlikely we'll get Curry unless Oxford stay... In the in the thing, he'll get. They'll sell him for for money that we won't be able to yes, afford. So yeah, that, that's for. So then it's Hemi, Kelman off. Yeah. It, it's Kelman or, or 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 Josh Keeley. Josh Keeley has just signed a new three year contract at Tottenham, but like Richie covered in there. Yeah, it could be either one. They might take like fifty grand for him, for example. But well, they've done say, that yeah. just so that they get gets a, a bit more money. But yeah, look, it is what it is. For me, I think it would probably be Keeley. Um, I think I'm probably kind of inclined to agree with you. Yeah, it could be, but it'd be Keely or Kelman. But they, you know, Kelman could leave for nothing, in theory. Yeah, in theory, for a very small fee. All right, budget increase. We have the 15th highest budget in League One, but uh, you know, budget increase doesn't necessarily mean you're getting more bang for your buck. Obviously, there's new contracts. That's exactly inflation, the point. player wages. It, everything goes up. It everything's does. gone up. It doesn't mean that we're going to get more for our money or better for our money. It just means we've got to spend more to get to, to tread even yeah. in some cases. Um, investment process is going well. Hopefully that's uh, we'll hear some more news on that soon. Yeah, players whose contracts are running down have been offered very attractive offers and some have not. So again, I mean, you know, we asked Richie the question. He's never going to say, yeah, we've offered this to this player. I'm not going to offer this player. We'll just have to see what comes out of the club. Yeah, there's a new um, supporters liaison officer. Her name is called April Smith. So if you have any questions or issues with match day stuff, uh, April is now the contact. I think there is a Twitter handle for the supporter at Leighton Orient SLO. Um, so it is now April Smith. Yeah, and uh, you know other things were spoken about. January transfer window, the supporters club. <coughs> Excuse me, a few more other bits and pieces were spoken about. Go and watch it. It's about just over an hour yeah. on the club's YouTube channel. Well worth a watch if you get the time to do so. Indeed, it is. Friday the 22nd of November then, as we move on, the next round of the Virtu Trophy, which was the Bristol Street Motors Trophy, but this is the parent company now getting busy. That was made, <laughs> and we'll face Charlton Athletic at the Valley uh, in the next round of that trophy. 
tie will be played on the week of the 9th of December. I think that's a really nice draw for us, to be fair. We could have gone to Exeter. I Possibly, think. We yeah. could have gone, down, gone as far away as that. So I, I reckon it'll be on TV. And to be honest, London Derby in that in that trophy um, wouldn't matter if it was. I'd like I'll go back. Hopefully I don't even know if they televise any of those games. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I, I don't obscure. know how seriously Charlton take that trophy. I guess it depends where they are in the league. I've got no idea, but you know, one that we can definitely win. Yeah. Went there in the league and only lost one 0 uh, a while ago. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Fingers crossed. The right, Kevin Lisby Derby comes <laughs> back again. <laughs> Amazing. Saturday the twenty third of November. The Youngos win Youth Alliance League action at home to NK Dons. We had a dream start. We took the lead in the fourth minute through Dan Carter. I know he's getting more popular yeah. on his podcast. With every passing week, the visit equalised though shortly after in the ninth minute. Then they took the lead in four minutes later. So three goals in the first 13 minutes. Despite creating a few chances, we couldn't find an equaliser. The Youngos fell to a 2 1 defeat. Unlucky there to yeah. the Youngos. No shame in that though. Main event of uh, Saturday was Stevenage away and before the game we ran a Twitter poll to find out how you think we'd get on in this match and after just 158 votes you decided as follows that 14% thought we'd lose 25% thought we'd draw but an overwhelming 65% thought we'd win which is really interesting to me as always 61 61% sorry not 69 I beg your pardon 61% thought we'd win so thanks to everyone for your votes alright at 2 o'clock the team was announced with Keeley in goal James Beckles Happy and Curry making up the back four Prattley Warrington and Galbraith in the middle with O'Neill Adji and Perkins making up the forward line on the bench we had Hemming Simpson Brown Ball Graham DJ and Charlie Kelman that meant that the O's were unchanged from the last league fixture at home to Blackpool from two weeks ago and obviously XO Dan Kemp Started for the host, obviously, Alex Ravel, former O's players, Alex Ravel and Scotty C. Scotty C. Make up the management team at Stevenage. No real surprises there. Same. Kept the uh, unchanged. Well, you know, look at the bench. That bench looks stronger than what we've seen. Hemming, Simpson, Brown, Ball, Graham, DJ, Coleman. Decent players, options off the bench. Yeah. It's good. But it does mean players like Obiero, Donnelly. Can't get him. Sweeney. A few good, decent players who aren't getting in that, so it's good, good competition for places. Love to see it. Yeah, absolutely right. Kid Samson, though, said it was a team full of slow weaklings in a winter storm at the most thuggish side in the division. What could possibly go wrong? Or it's think that should have kept it, uh, kept it sort of sweet. Said should be playing ball. Rob JB, nineteen seventy four, said got a feeling the weather is going to make today a right battle for both teams. Taking our chances when when they come will be key. David Cowan said, "I like the fact Richie can name an unchanged eleven, and Darren Pratt's experience should be invaluable in game management." Len Chin Chin one said, "We take on arch rival Stevenish today, who always seem to battle against. We always seem to battle against. Expect to see XO Dan Kemp play. If we play like a good defending side, we will make this a winner. We field a reasonable side, and goal scoring coming well." Um, we need to climb the table away from the bottom. All right, so the Alex Ravel, the Dan Kemp, Nick Freeman and the Scotty C Derby kicked off on a horrible windy day in Stevenage who was sitting in a mid-table place against an O's team looking for their fourth win on the spin. But Stevenage had an early opportunity. Dan Kemp played the ball to Reed, who was in on goal but an outstanding tackle by Lewis Warrington stopped him in his stride. I tell you what, I stood up and applauded that. I watched. I watched the game. That was an outstanding. <laughs> like, honestly, that shouldn't be underestimated. What an important challenge! If he gets that, if he gets that ever so slightly wrong, that's Off. a penalty. Okay. If he gets that ever so slightly wrong, that is done, and we're, we're one 0 down in the first few minutes of the game. Superb from him. All right. I mean, th- we've been very critical of Lewis because we haven't seen the best of. Or, or what what the scouting team saw in, yep. in in him. So it's it's only fair dues to to give him his you know to give him his credit where credit is due. All right, fair play. I mean, not much happens in this game as probably everyone listening to this knows. We're going to skip to the twenty fourth minute. Lewis Warrington got booked after he lunged in on Roberts. Yeah, he did. From the free kick, Tom James um, cleared the ball only as far as uh, Louis Thompson, who had an effort on goal which bounced in front of Keeley. He couldn't hold on to it. Nathan Thompson then fired the rebound wide under pressure from Dan Happy. Now I know what you're gonna say. You've tweaked that because that's I not, have. that's that's not what I wrote because it, it looked like Dan Happy got there before he did. I haven't seen it, I don't really care about it, nothing happened. That I know it was on the highlights and all their players appealed for a corner, which yeah. wasn't given right. He gave it, a goal it, kick. So. It looked like a it looked like a it looked like a corner. Yeah, yeah. That should have been a corner. Alright. Darren Pratty was booked. He goes booked on a half hour mark for a mistime tackle and then we've spoken about it, Richie. Richie also picked up a booking. Yeah, I should just point out as well, I think Keeley 
being a bit critical, I think he should have done better and held that okay. that last chance, and then we wouldn't be having that conversation um, as well. But I know it took a late bounce in front of him, but he, sh- he sh- still should have been ready uh, in some way, shape or form. 38 minutes on the clock now, superb piece of play from the O's as Tom James was under some pressure at right back, but made some room, lofted the ball down the, down the line to Sonny Perkins. That was a superb ball, uh, who was in loads of space, but his cross was cut out. That was a superb, that was great from Tom James. He had to turn back and kind of almost without looking up, he's literally just sent it down the line. Bosh. Perkins was in plenty of space and he drove forward. It was really good, really good passage to play that. All right, a minute later, Omar Beckles made a tackle. He's He prevented Reed from getting away, so... Blinding tackle, out by the sideline. If Reed nicks that past him, Omar sliding and Reed's on his way, he's gone. Done. Well played. And so he timed that superbly. Well done, Omar Beckles. Again, we've been critical of him at times, but he seems to be playing out of his skin. He's doing well. I love it. 43 minutes on the clock. Now, break from um, the Orient saw a superb cross field ball from Tom James that found Jack Curry wide on our left. He drove into the box, put a cross in, which bounced the round. It eventually came to Warrington, who tried to get his shot off, but that was cleared. All right, two minutes of added time were played out. No talking points as the sides went in goalless at half-time. They did. The attendance for this was just 4,259, with 989 away that fans. That like a low attendance. I mean, I know Stephen Giant's the best sport club in the world. I don't know what, oh, yeah. I don't know what their capacity is, but it was a bit low, did not it? Yeah, but half 12 kick-off, can they be bothered? Oh, Cold, so. windy. I know a few people that in my WhatsApp groups who were, were, were feeling it, who weren't feeling it, the weather, they were feeling a bit like there's bugs going around. People are mm. like, when am I going to go and sit out in this windy, rainy weather in Stevenage? So you what, take away the away attendance, what, 3,200? <sighs> yeah. It's not great, is it? No, mm. it's really not. Uh, I thought that was a poor quality half. Both sides really cancelling each other out. I know the wind probably played a massive factor in that as well. I thought Stevenage edged the possession. Ed- sorry, I don't think that. Stevenage <laughs> edged the possession and the shots. Somehow they had 52 or 55% possession, okay. which I didn't see. Um, it being as much as that. But yeah, they definitely had a few more attempts on our goal than us on theirs. All right, a few tweets at half time. Paul Red Rum. So I know it's always hard work playing Stevenage, but surely even with these conditions, we need to keep the ball on the deck. No Abiero on the bench is shocking. Obviously, Rishi has come here for a draw. No, obviously not. John P. Leach said, football the Stevenage way. Push the player, tug the player's shirt, a slide kick to the ankle, hit the deck and claim a foul. Referee falls on it every time. All right, no changes for the O's at half-time. Fast forward to the 58th minute as Louis Thompson put in a cross, got caught in the wind and almost caught Josh Keeley off guard. <coughs> As the ball hit the top of the crossbar. Yeah, but Keeley had it covered, so that's all good. Don Ball came on to replace Lewis Warrington in our first substitution that happened in the 59th minute. All right, shouts for a penalty for the home team in the hour mark as Dan Kent went over in the box. Nothing given. Play Thankfully, on. absolutely. 63 minutes on the clock, we made our second sub as Charlie Kelman came on to replace Sonny Perkins. All right, nothing really to talk about in a game that really didn't have anything going for it until the 81st minute as a corner came in from Stevenage. Found a head of list who headed over, thankfully. In the 81st, yeah. yeah. Cur- Curry, yeah, so he should have scored that. Thankfully, he didn't. Yeah. But for me, Curry was also lucky not to give a penalty away. He wrestled ha. his man, literally wrestled him to the ground. I know it doesn't show it on those highlights, but maybe the, uh, yeah. the club's extended ones will. But yeah, that was poor. He needs to be really careful uh, on Fair things about. like that. Because if you get a referee who... Well, to give pedantic, away it, it, you lose a game based on a silly piece of um, behaviour there. Ollie O'Neill was booked for not taking a throw where it should have been in the 84th minute, and that was his fifth yellow card of the season. All right, so he's out for Tuesday, silly. as Richie said in his interview on the 90 minute mark. Don Ball was fouled about 25 yards out, upstepped Tom James, everyone with bated breath was watching, and his free kick, though, was saved by Cooper. I think that was our first attempt on target, from what people were saying. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, three minutes of additional time were played. Nothing further to mention. The referee brought the game to an end with both teams having to settle for a point after the match finished goalless. Obviously, we do get Richie Wellens post match interviews from Dave Victor. We've heard enough from Richie on this podcast. We heard his thoughts on the game earlier. So, if you want to listen to that one or view it, you can do so on the club's YouTube channel. All right, League Table. And that draw means the O's have fallen on a place. To League One, we are now 21st. We've slipped into the bottom four. Although, worth pointing out, we've yeah. played two games less than Crawley Town. We beat Rotherham 1-0. So now Crawley are only one point and one place above us. Although we have two games in hand over them. So as it stands, we've played 15. We've won four, drawn three, 
lost eight. We've got 15 points and quite a healthy goal difference, actually. All the other teams around us have got minus double figures and goal difference. We've got minus four, so yeah. nothing to be sniffed at. It's a bit of Lejande. You watched the game on Sky. I did, yeah. Give me your views. That's Dreadful. Him. Dreadful. <laughs> it really was. It's, I feel like it's like 90 minutes of my life that I really won't get back. Okay. But I can't appreciate how difficult the conditions were because yeah. I, I wasn't there. I was sitting on the comfort of a couch. Um, but I thought both teams cancelling each other out. I thought they might have slightly edged it, to be honest with you. Um, I really like their right back as well. Very athletic, very strong, very clever. Um, and I'd take Piagiani into our back four as well. Yeah, he, he was tremendous. He bossed it. He does the ugly stuff really well, the hard yeah. stuff really, really well. That being said, I thought Dan Happy and Omar Beckles Bad were point. outstanding. Dan Happy, Marshall, Dan Kemp, he, uh, Omar Beckles went out to Reed, who was a pacey, tricky, dangerous little player. Um, but they both read the game really well. They marshaled the back line really well. Curry and Tom James were on, were on it as well. Keeley did well. Um, and that's four unbeaten mm. for us now, That's which is absolutely respectable. Clean sheet and a point on the road. Stevenage are doing better than us. I'd rather be in Stevenage's position than our position. Um, and, you know, look, if you're not going to win, just make sure you don't lose. Yeah, and you point. do that by keeping clean sheets. It's a shame we've dropped into the bottom four, but we've now got to make... As you pointed out, our two games in hand over Crawley count now so that we can move we can move up the table. Yeah, I mean my views are quite short and sweet. I mean the point away at Stevenage, I think we all would have taken it before the game, right? I think you know, yeah. people might not be happy with the performance, but at the end of the day, I think all you need to know is we took the point. Yeah, fair play, got away with it. I think you have to respect it. I will say, I think there's I'm concerned about the other teams around the bottom. I think we've got enough quality to get out of it, but you look Shrewsbury. around the bottom and you go Burton, probably won't get out of it. Um Cambridge uh, other than that, there. Cambridge are on a really good run actually. I didn't realise what a good run Cambridge are on. They started awfully and have really improved and picked up a point yesterday. And the one yeah, the one who really concerned me actually is Shrewsbury because Ainsworth is a much better manager than what people give him credit for. He'll yeah. Shrewsbury won't get relegated. I think he'll get him out. They beat Birmingham yesterday and his whole mentality is small club, big ambition. He's done exactly the same at Wickham. He'll get Shrewsbury out of that without a shadow of a doubt in my mind. And you look above the relegation, go Crawley you're expected to fall into it. And other than that, you've got Blackpool, Rob, Rotherham, Wigan, Wigan, Northampton, who are on 18 points, yeah. So it's but it's tight. I still I don't think we'll get relegated, but I think... But we're only a point, we're only yeah, a third of the way tight. the season. Like we keep it's saying, it's tight. a marathon, not a sprint. So, yeah. look, we win one of our games. Most other teams above us have played 16 games, so we've got a game in hand over them. We win, we win Tuesday night, we go up to 18 points. That puts us, that puts us, if we win one or two nil, that puts us in 16th. Sixteenth spot. A difficult game. Huddersfield to oh, talk no about fifth game. in the league. I'm so talking about like like it's a given. It's yeah. absolutely obviously not. But we move from twenty first to sixth. We move up yeah, five places yeah. with that with that win. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, moving on then. Uh, we had a lot of views that, that came in after this. Uh, obviously, none of them are really positive. But we're going to read <laughs> uh, a few of them out because they make some really good points. Dirk Turk kicked off this week. Said seen so many matches in my lifetime, but honestly, you think this would be right up there. In the top 10 were shocking from start to finish. One shot on goal and two fouls. Ha, Elvis Memphis in 90 minutes and we got one shot on target. Terrible. We are poor. Pass non-existent. Hoof ball. No game play. No system of play. Even more concerning. Which he only believes in two hours of training per day. No wonder we are so bad in every area. Um, I hope that Elvis listens to this. and Obviously Richie spoke about kind of the decision about how we played Stephen. Hopefully that gives a bit more context um, around it. Yeah, absolutely. Richie J. Bourne said, Poor game, but credit to the defence, and especially to Happy, who stopped Stevenage getting on the score sheet. O'Neill looked like he'd never took a throw in in his career. Yeah. I mean, a couple of them were, were a bit poor. Yeah. yeah I mean, foul throw. You can only, you can only tell them like you call them, right? Vince yeah. Howard, 73, so never really got going. Seemed happy to just get rid of the ball rather than try and build an attack. Expect a lot of that was due to having a week off and the conditions. Tom D. Simmons underscore Tom said, That was a good point. Awful game, not helped by any... Uh, not helped any by the weather. Dan Happy, the standout performer. A Jay Gabraith and O'Neill, all anonymous, and I hope for better on Tuesday night. Alex asked the on-score servant, said, what's happened to Oli O'Neill? And how is he starting every game? He's not even 10% of the player he was last season. Sad to see. Orion underscore Ed said, a game that was dictated by the conditions and neither team could get into their stride. Dan Happy was an absolute rock at the heart of the defence, but the attacking was non-existent. Still, it's a point and a clean sheet away from home at a horrid place. I'll take it. Charlie Paul was getting a good a game so dull, it made me miss the international break. Not a bad point under the conditions and on to Tuesday. Theo Archibald said, horrific atmosphere from us and it leaked onto the pitch. Not sure why we're so quiet at Stevenage. 
but wow, it was poor. Richie also seemed to get everything wrong. Would be nice if Ajay fancied jumping for a header on Tuesday. Daniel underscore D44 said, no lack of effort, but even alone for the conditions, that was a poor game devoid of any quality. We seemed to lack a game plan, and every pass forward seemed to be directed straight at Piajani. But a point is a point, and hopefully we can up our game on Tuesday. Steve Chaplin 4 said, not a lot to say about that one. The conditions, small and bumpy pitch, conspired against any intentions to play football. The fact that there was less than 10 shots overall with only one each on target is proof. OV0513 said, so I checked our last 234 league games before today, which is as far back as records go. And in not a single one did we complete so few passes, 103, at such a bad success rate at 43%. I mean, I don't know how you've checked that, but... Um, That's a lot amazing. of research. Stats. Well played. Gary Co 7 said, We did well to stand up to the physical battle. In these types of games, you're hoping to hit them on the break, which never happened. Easy game to lose. A point isn't the end of the world. Yeah, good tweet. That final word this week goes to Aussie LOFC. He said, That was a game I'll remember forever. Didn't feel like we were in control at all. Really need someone to bring the ball down and play. We got dragged into playing their way. The international break came at the wrong time, but it's a clean sheet and it's a point. And on to Huddersfield. Indeed. So those were views on uh, our draw at Stevenage. Do you agree or disagree with any of the tweets we've read out? Let us know what you think. We're on uh, Twitter, at or in Outlook. We're also on Blue Sky Search or in Outlook uh, podcast. Uh, we are on Instagram or in underscore Outlook underscore podcast. Search for us on Facebook. And also you can email us if you're not on social media. We're or in Outlook at Outlook.com. All right, prediction league update. Well done to Stephen Orient, Jones9594, to Boatsy, that's all O's fan. And my favourite, actually, the Borough Pod, which is a, a Stevenage podcast who done a prediction and said Neil as well. And almost really? called it perfectly. So they all predicted Neil well played. Got three points. So that means the top of the prediction league is as follows. Theo Archibald is still top on 18 points, followed by Rich Denham on 16 points with Alex RC underscore seven. In third place on 11 points. So Theo Archibald and Rich Denham opening up a bit of a gap. Thanks to everyone for their predictions. And you can find the Prediction League table on our Facebook page. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to Sunday the 24th of November. Big ladies update after today's match. It was a very new look Orient women's side who faced Comet WFC at Buckhurst Hill in a Greater London Premier League match. The Comets arrived with the reputation of being a jo- of joint favourites for the league title this season and were the clear form team, having won their last four games convincingly. Orient, on the other hand, had scant opportunity to train together as a team containing no less than five new faces and a change of leadership after the recent departure of the head coach. All right, in blustery conditions, it was the ladies in red with the braces who spent most of the time in possession. Lily Amelia blasted a shot inches wide within the first minute. With the O's defence looking bulletproof, new striker Callie Balfour cut open the Comets defence in the 17th minute, but was appended before she could score. So up stepped Steph McCaffrey, who made no mistake from the penalty. 1-0 to the Orient. Yeah. Uh, 22 minutes, Comets won a free kick and scored directly from it. It was a worldie. Or the wind took it to the top corner. We're not sure which, but the scores remain level at half-time despite the O's exerting most of the pressure. Going off piece did. The Tottenham ladies played West Ham yesterday at Brisbane Road. And one of the Tottenham ladies, I don't think she meant it, put like a 35-yard one into the top bins right did in front she? of the south stand. Unbelievable goal. Really? I, yeah, Was if she busy? meant it, no. Didn't really see me, but an absolute stunning goal in there. So second half continued in the same vein with several O's players getting half chances. Our person of the match, Callie Balfour, was replaced by top striker Leanne Bates. And it was Leanne who took less than a minute to accept the McCaffrey pass. Thumped in the winner to make it 2-1 to Orient. Comets showed what a tenacious, fit and able squad they are, but never really carved out a clear-cut chance. We think this is a measure of much pro- in- of a much improved midfield and defence qualities as delivered by Riley Whale, Jade Keogh, Sophie Kelly and Esme Lancaster. Keeper Delaney Saville looked confident between the sticks and so our ladies managed the game uh, to the final whistle without a mishap. This will raise eyebrows once the rest of the league see the result or it have turned the corner. All right. Next week, it's, it's, sorry, next week it's Greater London League action away at Luton Town. You can go on to lofcwomen.com and all the updates, information and league intel is on that website for you. All right, let's wrap this up. One hour, 33 minutes, 53 seconds. Bumper pod, fantasy football. All right, top of the on Outlook podcast, Premier Fantasy League is Darren Mulhall with his disaster O's, 773 points. He's leading uh, Stuart Coleman in second place. Coleman Balls, love it, 759 points. I have had a shocker. I'm in 164th oh, place. Oh, no, come on. Out of 377 players going downhill very quickly. So go and check your position if you are playing that very game in Fantasy EFL, which is the 
EFL um, equivalent we have our own league. Leading that one is G Hughes on 1,163 points. Behind him is S Pollard on 1,113 points. I'm doing slightly better in this one, in 13th place out of 41 players. Both are great fun. Go and check out where you are. It's probably too late to join if anyone wants to. But hey, let's have some fun and do it anyway. Go and check those apps and thanks for playing in our fantasy leagues. So next up, as always, we do the positives and the negatives. All right, positives of the fortnight. We're unbeaten in four games, right? Yeah. So something not to be sniffed at at all. Sorry, just I think, I don't know if Richie said it on the interview or, or off, but we've played better against better teams and lost. So yesterday we've mm. played not played great and we've got something from it. So Out. you have to mix it up, right? Absolutely, you certainly do. Second one, clean sheet versus Stevenage. I think that's our third clean sheet in four games as well. So well done to the defence. And also through to the knockout stages of a cup competition. So Charlton away in the next round, hopefully we'll get through that and yeah. get closer to those, uh, not golden arches, that big tower, whatever they call it these days, or if it goes across the Probably arch. The arch, yeah. The arch, yeah. See you there. But also, it's more money uh, of it is. for us as well yeah. um, in that competition. Negatives, uh, we've got three negatives. Obviously the performance against Stevenage. Um, Ollie O'Neill's fifth booking he's now facing a ban but that presents like Richie said an opportunity yeah. for Jordan Graham to possibly play and obviously now we uh, thanks to Crawley's uh, miraculous win yesterday we've now dropped into the bottom four but like Steve said we have two games in hand over them we certainly do mm. right hero of the fortnight so it's been unanimous on out of podcast hours this week's hero of the fortnight is Mr Theo Archibald so we wish you a speedy recovery um, we're gutted for you and um we look forward to uh, seeing you around Brisbane Road. I'm sure you'll come and support the lads when they're playing. Um, yeah, all the best to you. Yeah, absolutely. Right, next week's fixtures in. The O's have two home fixtures coming up this week. First up, we welcome Huddersfield Town and the Josh Caroma Derby on Tuesday, the 26th of November. Huddersfield having a decent season, obviously, winning the championship last year. Got relegated. They're currently sitting fifth in League One. They beat Charlton Athletic 2-1 at home on Saturday. Obviously, that game, £10 for adults. Go and get yourself a ticket if you've got nothing else going on on Tuesday. Then the O's welcome Oldham Athletic to Brisbane Road in the Richie Wellens Derby on Saturday the 30th of November. Second round of the FA Cup. Oldham again, their fifth in their league. They didn't play yesterday. Their match at Rochdale got postponed. I think um, Oldham are going to be quite a few. I think they've already sold strong. a lot of strong yeah. amount They're a big of tickets. Club. They're a big club that have just been mis- misowned, badly owned, and they are where they are. I'm amazed that one's not on TV. I think that's got potential upset material they beat Tranmere in the last round they got James Norwood uh, who's a good striker at National League level and obviously was at Ipswich a couple of years ago if you're going to either game come and say hello in the South Stand give us a tweet before during or after the game indeed sponsorship reminders so don't forget get in touch with John and their fantastic team of florists experienced florists on 0208 529 4130 or get in contact via their social media they're Carol Langley E4 Carol's got an E on the end or at Essex Biz that's on Twitter they're also on Instagram search Carol Langley Florist all one word and they're also on Facebook just search Carol Langley Florist alright so that is it thanks for joining us for episode 371 you wait two weeks for only one match then when it comes it's instantly forgettable and the O's played out a board draw at Stevenage but we take the point we respect it and we move on and now with two home games this week. The O's have a chance to kickstart the season as we take on Huddersfield Town and League One action on Tuesday. As we welcome back, and I think he'll get a great reception actually. Josh Caroma, yeah. I think he'll get a really good reception. And then we face Oldham Athletic in the FA Cup in a competition where we are looking to progress. All right? If we win that, who knows where we might end up? We could end up in the Etihad, could end up in Ansfield. No one else will end up somewhere. Tamworth. Some dink hole somewhere in some National League North side somewhere. All right, obviously. You can hear about both of those matches and hopefully, fingers crossed, two wins in the next episode of the Orient Outlook podcast. You certainly will. If you're listening on iTunes, please subscribe. Give the podcast a five-star rating. It really does help the algorithms in terms of people finding Orient content. If you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to rate the show. You can even leave a comment on each episode. Please do so if you get the chance. And don't forget to follow us or add us to your favourites on your chosen podcast provider. That way you'll get all the episodes as soon as they're available. We're also on Smart Speakers. We're on the Fan Hub app and we're also on YouTube now. Just audio, uh, so that listening to us could never be easier. If you've got an older relative, a loved one, an Orient chum, a friend or a colleague or an acquaintance that's got a passing interest in Leighton Orient who you think would be uh, interested in keeping up to date with what's going on at Brisbane Road, grab their phone, download it for them and pass the pod. All right. Once again, thank you to uh, Super Richie Wellens and the O's media team for that interview. I mean, that was a 55-minute interview with Richie. Yeah. I thought it was some great insight Brilliant. there. 
always good to speak to Richie. So we'll be back with episode 372 next week with all the information and views that you could ever need. We look forward to hearing from you. And as always, keep calm, stay safe, have a great week, and listen to the Orient Outlook podcast. Up the O's.